Hey everyone, Joe here. Today we're gonna to be going through a full drum mix. I'm gonna show you how I turn this into this. So I recently mixed this Alice Cooper cover for an awesome rock band called Powderhead. They recorded these stems over in a practice studio, sent them over to me um, to work my magic. Now I'm gonna go through the whole mix and show you everything I've done basically, um, from the plugins I used to how I used them, the thought process behind everything I did to give you an idea of where to start when mixing drums basically and, and what kind of things you need to be looking out for. So I'm gonna mute all these plugins first and start from pretty much from scratch. I've still got the um, the levels set there, but I'll talk about my decisions when it came, comes to the levels and everything as well. But starting from the top, the first thing that I always do when I start a drum mix is just listen through to basically each individual track. So have a, have a look what, what they've sent over the band. That's if I haven't recorded it myself already, but just to see what we're working with. So I'll listen to the kick. Um, and then you can see I've also got a, a, a second kick mic that I've been sent there that's pointing to the beta. So just see what we're working with, listen through every track. Now there are a couple of tracks that I actually muted uh, early on. I was also sent an, um, a room, room mic as well and listening back, listening to it. Um, yeah, it gives a little bit of room, but I wasn't sure if I needed it and so I muted it and, and just in case I needed it later on um, for a little bit of extra roominess. But yeah, and also I wasn't a fan of how the beta, um, the beta mic came out. So I muted that to begin with. You can always go back to it later, but I feel like I can get enough of that kind of punch and that click, that top end from what I've already got with the uh, the internal kick mic. So once I've listened through to all the individual tracks, I'll do a little bit of gain staging, um, just a rough level mix across the board. So if anything's super quiet, for example, this, this kick came through very quiet. I just lifted up the level a little bit. Now you can just leave that to your faders. I could have just brought it up with the fader here, an extra four dB, but when something's super quiet or super loud, I'd prefer to use the clip gain to get them at least equal so that I'm not starting my level mix with the fader already at the top because it just makes it a little bit uh, more difficult to make changes if you're already sort of way down at the bottom or, or at the top. So you can probably hear that I have already done a rough level mix. You've got the kick and the snare at sort of roughly the same, rough peaking at roughly the same level. Nothing's, nothing's been overpowered. Just a quick point, I'm obviously mixing in Pro Tools here, but this applies to any DAW you're using. And the next thing that I'll do is doing some time alignment. Now, when you record the same thing with two different microphones or, or one with DI and one with a microphone, for example, the waveforms often don't line up. If you zoom right in here, you can see we've got the snare here. That's where it starts. And then you've got the overhead, the wave starts there. Now, they need to line up really um, as much as they can. I tend to line everything up so that it's basically in line with the overheads, but I don't do it manually normally. I'll use a, a time adjuster plugin, which I'll show you in a second. Um, just a quick word on, on time alignment. If you've got a couple of mics recording the same, uh, the same instrument and they're not time aligned, you can find you'll lose some of the, um, the low end or if it's out of phase, it can, it can just sound a bit odd. So what I do basically is I'll get the snare. I've got, got, the, got both the snare mics going to a snare bus because they're pretty much in line with each other. And then I've got my time adjuster tool. Whatever door you're using, it should have, have a similar, similar plugin. And then I'll find out how many samples, samples they are from each other. So 107, I've set mine to 104. It's, you know, I'm doing this by eye, so it's not gonna be perfect, but 
So what that does is shifts the snare back. It delays it by 104 samples. So that um, will, will mean that it's in line with the overheads. If you're curious as to why I use this time adjuster plugin rather than just shifting the waveform forward, um, well, for starters, we can we can AB it. We can listen to to it with and without very easily rather than having to undo the move that you've done. Uh, and secondly, if you've got any more mixes that were recorded um, recorded in the same session, you can sort of they'd normally be the same um, the same amount of delay that needs adjusting to. So you can reuse the same setting. I've then done the same with the hi-hat there and oh, I did the same with the room but again we're not using that at the moment uh, and I think that's everything in terms of time alignment. The next thing I've done after I've done my time alignment I'll go through each drum individually one by one and listen to what we're working with, do some basic EQ and compression, get rid of the stuff we don't want and and have a, have a think about what we do want. Now, this is a cover, uh, as I mentioned, Feed My Frankenstein. It's got that kind of, uh, I think it's early 90s, but it's got that kind of 80s style arena rock, um, big big snare, big drum sound, gated, uh, gated reverb. So I had that in mind going in. I was listening to the original and, and some other Alice Cooper stuff and had that in mind. Um, when going into the mix. So that's that's a really important thing that you have a listen to a reference track beforehand. But yeah, let's listen to this kick first. I do like to start with the kick. What have we got? It's a bit boxy. It's a, it's a nice punchy recording, um, but it needs some work. So I started off with the Eddie Kramer drum channel. It does so much for a kick drum. and. I don't tend to use it on, on all the drums. I think I'm only using it on the kick on this one. Um, but yeah, it's got a compressor in it. It's got the gate. Uh, it, you, it's got some reverb if you want that, but I've got that off. You can adjust the treble and the bass. Um, as you can hear there. And you can adjust the intensity of it. We don't want to go too crazy. But yeah, it just really gives it some punch, uh, a little bit of low-end body as well. Then what I did was I EQ'd it. I always high-pass uh, high pass filter out though the very low ends, even on the kick drum, um, just below 25 hertz, because we really don't need anything below there. It's just, just rumble, basically. Boosted that 60 hertz by a fair amount and reduced the around 110 because it sounded a little bit yeah that kind of um, sort of low to low mid sort of uh, muddiness basically and and also I knew the band was going to then mix the guitar and bass to this and everything as well so I carved a little bit of space out there for a bass guitar um, then we got a very small cut 1db it's kind of a bit Again, remove a bit of that sort of boxiness um, and then then used a, a low pass filter at the top where we don't need, need that very top end over 17k. Then it's going into another compressor, it's going into the 1176 clone. Very fast attack and release this compressor, it really gives it some punch. And then boosted the top end around 3k just to really let it smack give it some presence now I'm going to go into into the rest of that later let's move on to the snare so we got the snare bottom mic which is pointing up at the snare strings quite bright uh, it just gives it's nice having both the top and the bottom so you, you've you've got that kind of play between them you can control how much of that kind of snare string sound that top end that you want and then now right off the bat with this this, this top mic on the snare 
um, it's a bit boingy. Like, it's all really well played, but the the sound of the snare didn't come out fantastically. So right off the bat, I decided to do some drum replacement on on that top snare mic. Um, now I'd never go too overboard with the with the uh, the replacement, but sometimes when you're going for a specific sound, it 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 can really help. So I've used the trigger, uh, Stephen Slate trigger, and that's triggering a sample there. You can hear them individually there. Because again, listening to that original um, that original song, I really wanted that kind of trashy, big, uh, big, powerful snare sound. And then I've blended it in with the original um, bottom mic on the on the original snare. And then both of those still needed a little bit of work. So again, cut cut a fair amount of that low end. Don't need that on the snare and some of the boxiness in the middle. And then I've used the Waves MV2. You can compress the, the top end and the bottom end separately. And then I've used Arcom again, just for some more compression. Got quite a slow attack on there. I don't want to be cutting off those, uh, those transients. And then we'll go into that after. But let's take a look at that bottom snare. So I've actually used a, a preset on this. It's just a, a very quick preset that works nicely with uh, bottom snare mics. Just to give them a bit of power and gate out uh, the rest of the drums. And then again, I've gone for the MB2, the R comp. Let's listen to those together now. Yeah, nice and big and powerful. Um, fair amount of body, got a ni nice bit of top end as well. And let's move on to the overheads now. See what we've got there. So I've EQ EQ'd those the same, mainly around that 400 hertz mark to try and get rid of some of the snare because the snare sounds really great from the snare mics and, and from the trigger. So I, I don't really want it coming through all that much on the overheads. Uh, and then I've taken out most of the kick as well. At that point, I'll pan them just to give us that sense of how the drums, the kit's gonna sound. Let me compress them both. Very fast attack on, on that compression because again, I wanted to catch the peaks of the snare. A little boost uh, right up at the top to get, get some sizzle out of those cymbals. And then with the snare and the ride, again, I've gated to remove some of that bleed. Um, and I'm just using using the channel strips here. They're very easy to use. I like these Pro Tools channel strips. Just got everything in one place. Uh, again, we've cut out almost all the low end on those. Um, I kept a little bit of the body on the on the hi hat, but yeah, right up to 300 the high pass filter on the ride. And then I boosted these separately just because I wanted them to kind of differentiate. From each other, so I've I've given the uh, the hi hat some more of that kind of really sizzly, not too much, but up at around 12k, and then on the ride, yeah, around around 4k, just had that nice kind of that that shimmer of of the of the ride. I then pan those roughly where they are on on the overheads so so just listen to the overheads the hi-hat is somewhere around around there and the ride I 
It means that when all of them are in together, you don't get this kind of weird wash of... Uh, for example, if I pan the, the ride right over there... Um, and then the hi-hat over here. It kind of sounds separated. You've got this wash of, of hi-hats and rides coming from all over the place. Uh, it just helps keep them keep them tighter. And then the last thing for our, our initial uh, soloed mix, we're going to have a look at the toms. So I've put these through a bus. They're going through this Kramer tape, um, just to give it a little bit kind of tape saturation. And then I've gated these out. I'm going to open all of these, actually. So we've got the rack. Rack one, rack two, rack uh, floor tom. Sorry. So you can see I've gated these out quite heavily because the response that you get from a tom mic with the with the rest of the kit doesn't normally sound sound great. Um, it's that kind of residual bleed from the drums and snare. So I've gated most of that out. Um, taken off the top end again, and as you can see. I've left a lot of the low end in there on the floor tom. Um, we're only only cutting out a lot of this, that kind of that boingy boxiness. I didn't want it in there on any of them, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I've gone a little bit, left a little bit more of that that very low end in on on the floor tom. And then we're compressing them with the 1176 compressor again. And boosted a bit of that low end on the rack tom. And again on the floor tom, a bit more. Sorry, the second rack tom and then the floor tom got a fair, fair amount of, of boost around, uh, around 70, 70 hertz. And you can really hear the body of those of those toms coming in now. But then I, I I didn't feel that it was quite enough low end. Just the way that it came out in the recording, it felt it needed a little bit more body in there. So I used the Max Bass from Waves to get a bit of boominess. I put it up there around 80, uh, well, at exactly 84 hertz. Um, didn't want to go any lower than that. So it started interfering with the kick. We listen to them together now. They have kind of carved their own place out in the mix. Now let's have a listen to all of it together um, where we are at the moment. Yeah. So we've got a lot of that punch back um, on the snare and the kick. Got that shimmeriness on the cymbals. In fact, I'll just compare it quickly on um, to to how we, to where we were when we started. <clears throat> now at this point I really wanted to get the reverb on the snare because it really does change the way that the kit sounds as soon as you got the reverb on. So what I've got is this the uh, the waves are verb arena snare. I've called the channel room but I ended up using a hall anyway. Um, I mean the, the the two things you need to need to consider when getting that kind of arena sound, arena rock sound is you want large size and a kind of medium length um, length tail, and then you're basically just gating it out. So let me show you what I mean. And then you've got that tail of the reverb disappearing. So you just got that big. And then the tail quickly dies away. Cut a little bit of the low end out with the onboard EQ just to stop it from getting muddy. And let's put that on everything now, actually. Let's have a listen. Okay. Now the snare still feels a little bit flat. So I've got the good old decapitator on there, basically just a harmonic exciter distortion type plugin. Um, but it sounds really cool on snares. Let's have a listen. Just 
just to give it a bit of a bit of grit. Then I've used this Slate Digital Revival. It's giving it a lot more top end uh, and a bit of body as well. And then th this plugin is so helpful. If you've got a, a side note, I'm not like endorsed by Waves or anything. I mean, there are loads of great plugin manufacturers out there. I just tend to use uh, a fair few Wave plugins. But yeah, this this Smack Attack it makes it so easy just to get extra punch out of out of a, a drum. Have a listen. I mean, wow. Just a huge amount of snack, and you can turn it high, up higher than that. I haven't even got it all the way wet. Then just turn down the volume a bit because it, it boosts it quite a lot. Let's get the bottom snare in there as well. Get the decapitator on that. Revival. And then gave it, gave it a little bit more on that. Gave it a little bit more on the top end just to really get it cutting through. Yeah, I want that, that dropping off quite quickly, that, that, that um, tail on the ring. Cool. Then back to the kick. I wanted a little bit more low end on the kick as well, just to really get it punching so you could really feel it. Uh, so I've used the R bass. It's kind of like the, um, the Max bass that we used on the toms. It's just a, a bit more intense. Uh, a bit more focused. Makes a huge difference. Then again, I've got the decapitator on there just to give it a little bit of grip. And then with the toms, when everything's in there, when you've got the, the toms from the overheads, the bleed uh, from the other mics, there's kind of a bit of low mid, a bit of low mid, mid mud. So I've used a multi-band compressor there and really focused in on that 200 hertz mark. Just to tame, tame that frequency when it gets a bit much on the toms. And then I might be relying on this plugin a little bit too much, but on the toms, again, they need a little bit more, more punch in there. And the smack attack did the job for that. Let's bring everything back in. Uh, bring that reverb down a tiny bit on the snare. Yeah, that works better. And then to help the kick sit with the toms nicely, again, I've used a multi-band compressor around the, the 90 hertz mark, just above where that very low end is, where we've been boosting for the kick. Um, just to help carve out a little section for uh, the, the floor tom in particular. Now that's sounding good, nice and big and punchy. Uh, the, the, one of the final things I'm gonna show you is the auxiliary bus that I sent, sent them all through. I like, on, on, on most of my, my drum buses, I'll put on uh, a multi-band compressor just to even things out, help glue things together. So let's have a listen. And then I've given the whole kit a little bit of tape saturation as well. And there you have it, that's a full drum mix. Uh, if you have any questions at all about any part of the, the process that I've showed you, just leave them in the comments section below. If you're struggling with mixing any specific part of the drum kit, I'd be happy to have a chat and help out. I know getting your head around drum mixing and, and knowing where to start um, and getting it all sound balanced can be a tricky tricky thing for some, some of you mixers out there. I'll be putting out more recording and mixing content like this on, on drums and, on, and other topics as well. Every single week there's a new video, so hit that subscribe button if you wanna see more. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.